Hey, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming to church. For those of you who may not have been here the last few weekends, we're in the study of the book of Colossians, and it's so important to be opening up the Word of God and looking at it and studying it, because it provides so much for us. We know that when you study the Word of God, you learn His promises, and how important those promises are to build your faith, that you trust Him for answers and His heart to bless your life. You get wisdom for direction and making decisions, and you get inspiration and hope, and all these wonderful things come from the Word, but the Word does one more thing, which is just as good, but very different, and this morning, I believe that's what the Word's gonna do. Here's what it does. It exposes us. It shows us areas of our life where we need just an adjustment, and we're not even aware of it. I had a friend who got a job, and in order to get the job, he had to get a routine physical, so he went in just to get a routine physical as part of what was required for the job, but in the routine physical, they discovered an incredibly serious illness that he had no idea that he had. It was kind of a jarring moment for him on one hand. It was like, whoa! But on the other hand, he was so grateful because they were able then to take care of it, and he walks in full health. That's what the Word does. The initial moment is kind of like, whoa, but we can be grateful because on the other side of it, we can walk in everything that God has for us. And most importantly, this morning, if you will open your heart and mind, Jesus wants to take you to a place of such incredible freedom and joy that is a weight that you are carrying that he literally wants to remove permanently from your shoulders if you will let him, but it'll begin with a whoa. I didn't know I was doing that. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Spirit of God, speak to each one of us uniquely and distinctly. We open up our minds, our hearts. We are ready to be jarred if you need to do that because we know on the other side of it will be such great joy and freedom. We pray this in the name of Christ, amen. Amen, open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter one. We're gonna look at just three verses, but they are a pretty profound and strong three verses that will really set a trajectory of your faith in Christ. Here's what it says, Colossians one, verse 21. Once you who were alienated from God, you were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. But now he has reconciled you through the death of Christ in his physical body in order to present you holy and blameless in God's sight as you stand before God without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth. Stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the hope you received when you heard the gospel. If you write an email, there's always somebody you're writing the email to, and there's a reason why you're writing the email. And if I was to read the email that you wrote, it would really help me understand what's in the content of that email if I know who you're writing it to and why are you writing it. Well, in a sense, Paul is writing an email. It comes in the form of a letter here. Paul had traveled all over the region preaching the gospel, but then he settled down in a city called Ephesus. It was a big city, and for two years he kind of planted himself there. And everybody came to him to hear him preach about Jesus and the gospel of the kingdom. And there was one young guy who heard him and immediately was converted. This guy was full of passion, full of fire. His name was Epaphras. The Bible teaches us that he actually went to other towns and began to spread the news. One of the towns he went to was a town called Colossae. And he went there and he spread the news and a bunch of people got saved and they started a church. And you had these young, vibrant, passionate Christians in this church in Colossae. They wanted everything that was available for them in the kingdom of God. They were like you and I. You are here this morning to press into everything God has for you. When you read through the book of Colossians, as you watch how Paul writes, you begin to discover what they were looking for. They wanted the fullness of God. They wanted all of God. Like you, they didn't want to miss any part of God and his revelation in their life. They wanted power in their life. They were tired of failure. They were tired of their lives being so easily dictated by the enemy, and they wanted power over the enemy. They wanted holiness. They wanted to live 
in a right way, not just in their actions, but in their desires. They wanted their lives to honor God. They're like us. You could almost say if there's one letter of the New Testament that speaks most directly to us that we match up with, it's Colossians. Paul is not writing to unchurched unbelievers. He's writing to these young, vibrant, passionate Christians who want everything that's available for them from God. So why in verse 23 does he write, don't drift away from the hope you received when you heard the gospel? He's commended their faith. You'd think he'd go, wow, this is fantastic. Keep it up. But he gives them a warning because he knows that there is this subtle danger that can take place in their lives and in our lives, and we're not even away from it. There is this mysterious drift that happens. A few years back, I was in Huntington Beach with my niece who's in her 20s and a much younger niece. We had a surfboard. We thought, oh, we're going to go surfing I don't really surf, I fall, I'm more of a faller than a surfer, but I like being out there. So we went out there and we don't know much about the water at all and we're out there and we got the young niece on the surfboard and we're just kind of playing around and before you know it, it's like we blinked our eyes and we had drifted so far off the coast. And my niece and I looked at each other deep in the water and we just knew, oh no, this is serious. We've got to do some intense things just to get back to the coast. We were unaware of it. We get caught up and we become unaware of it. And this morning in his goodness and his grace, God wants to kind of make you aware of something, this drift. That's why Colossians 2.8, here's what Paul said. Make sure no one captures you with powerless ideas and ways that come through human thinking and spiritual concepts of this world and not on Christ. What is this drift? Well, here's what it's not. It's not backsliding. Backsliding is a term used in the church for people who used to go to church and seem to follow Christ and now they have rejected Jesus. They don't come to church anymore. They begin to have some life practices that are not really healthy and do not honor God. And so we use this term backsliding. That's not what Paul's talking about. He is not talking to Christians who have said, screw God, screw the church, I'm out of here. He is talking to Christians who are passionate about God, who want everything. They're not rejecting Jesus. They're adding to Jesus. They're not rebelling against Jesus. They're saying, I'm grateful for what Jesus has done, I just gotta add more to it if I'm gonna get everything. What were they adding that we add? One of the big ones is Christian practices, religious practices. It's one thing when you read your Bible and you pray, which you should do, but it's another thing when your approach towards it is, listen, I gotta read my Bible and I gotta pray because otherwise then God won't give me what I need in his kingdom. I gotta read my Bible and I gotta pray, otherwise then I'm under the guilt again. I gotta do these religious practices and they become like levers to get God work. We add them to Jesus. We're grateful for everything Jesus did, but whatever it may be, we add it to it thinking somehow that's the lever, that's the key. I had a really good friend and every morning he would wake up. He sh should do what we do. He reads his Bible, he prays. But he told me after a season of this, he began to discover that if he ever skipped a morning, he'd go through the entire day with this enormous false sense of guilt. He'd go through the day thinking, oh, my family's not protected anymore. I can't stand under the promises of God anymore. And he realized he had drifted. That Jesus alone, his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his protection wasn't enough. He had to add these Christian practices to it to make sure he could get everything in the kingdom. And Paul says, you got to be careful. Because it's subtle. It's not the bad things. It's actually really good things. But we treat them in a way that we think, if I just add this to Jesus, then I'll break into everything. That power I'll break into everything. Along with Christian practices, a life of personal significance. And here's where it's difficult. God has a destiny for your life. He has a purpose for you. 
But if we don't guard our heart, we begin to think, I'm grateful for everything Jesus has done, but I need my life to really count. I need to make a difference. I need to do something that separates me from everybody else that makes a difference. Then life will truly be meaningful. Then my identity will be complete when I have done something of significance. And sometimes people even go into ministry because what they're doing is adding to Jesus. I'm grateful for what he's done, but I need this other component of significance to really bring meaning to everything in my life. And Paul says, I'm warning you. It doesn't work that way. And what you're passionate about getting, you'll actually lose even more. The enemy can take anything and deceive us. For example, some of us, we know we add to Jesus, just good things, his blessings. I'm grateful for Jesus, but I need good things to happen in my life. And when good things happen in my life, added to what Jesus has done for me, then I walk into everything God has for me. And the reason why we know it's a drift, because if the good things are ever removed, our relationship with Jesus completely falls apart. We wonder if he even likes us or loves us or cares. And Paul is warning this church and he's warning us 2,000 years ago, I'm so grateful for your passion, but be careful that you don't find yourself in this drift. Because here's what will take place. He describes it in Colossians chapter 2, verse 19. They lose connection with the head, who's Christ, from whom the whole body, supported and held together, grows as God causes it to grow. He said what actually happens is when you add anything to Jesus, you actually diminish Jesus. In your attempt for more of God, you end up with less of God. And you have these traits, like you have this despair. It's like, I know I'm saved, but Jesus doesn't just seem to be enough, so I'll do this stuff and add to it that'll make it enough, and yet that doesn't work either, and so there's like this despair of, I feel like I'm not tapping into all the things of God, and it leads to doubt. Instead of this incredible daily joy and unbelievable freedom, we spend much of our time questioning our status before God. Where do I stand now? How do I rank? My friend wouldn't do his morning devotions. That was the question throughout the day. Does God still like me? Does he still look at me in the same way? And we begin to question with doubt, where do we stand before God? We drift. It's like me on the ocean. You just kind of lose your way. And before you know it, you are out there in a big ocean all by yourself, and you weren't even aware of it during the process. You go, how did I get here? So Paul sees you, like he saw the Colossae church, and he goes, man, I'm so thrilled for your passion. But no, there is this dangerous element that you've got to be aware of. Some of you are drifting, and you're not rebelling and rejecting Jesus. But you're adding your effort, your work, something to Jesus as a means of thinking, this will bring me all meaning and all life and all purpose. And Paul teaches us in these three verses, here's how you stop the drift from happening. In verse 21, you got to know who you were before you met Jesus. In verse 22, you got to know who you are now. And in verse 23, you got to know how you live in your new identity, in the new you. If you know who you were, who you are, and how to live in it, then you will never run the danger of the drift. Because the consequence of the drift is you end up carrying this weight. Some of you are here this morning. And I'm so grateful that the Lord brought you here because you are carrying a weight. How do I make my faith happen? And there is a burden and the Lord wants to remove that from you and give you a freedom and a joy for everything Jesus has done. So here are these three things. Let's take a look at them. You got to know who you were. Colossians 1, 21. Once you were alienated from God, you were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Now, let's be a little honest. Isn't that kind of harsh? 
I mean, really, your evil thoughts, your evil actions, an enemy of God, it seems just a little harsh. I got a neighbor. He's a nice guy. He's not a Christian. Evil? He honors my faith. He's helped me out. He's a good husband. He's got a nice kid, good family. Doesn't do bad stuff. He honors uh, the church. He's not against the church or anything like that. Can you imagine me going to him this afternoon going, look, you're evil, man. Evil actions, evil thoughts. You're the enemy. That just would not play very well. Because when we see the word evil, we only define it in one dimension. And when we only define it in one dimension, we don't understand the significance of what Christ has done. Think of the word evil or the idea evil with two words, a moral evil and a spiritual evil. A moral evil is when you do bad stuff. It's like Hitler falls into that category. You know, when you break the commandments, when you steal, when you murder, when you are just mean and cruel, when you're angry, when you're a racist, some of the moral evil are so bad that our society puts you in prison. There's a moral evil. And when people live in that moral evil and Jesus rescues them and saves them and they become a Christ follower, they are born again, they know it. The change is dramatic. They know, wow, I know who I used to be and I know who I am now. And some of you in here know what I'm talking about. But for many of us, you're like me. I was never that morally evil. I never did the bad stuff. So here I am, and I'm a pretty good guy, like my neighbor. What I am is spiritually evil. I'm an enemy of God because I am fighting with God for the lordship over my life. He's my creator. He is my Lord. He formed me. He's the potter. I'm the clay, but it doesn't matter. I will control my life. And Paul says, Joel, you are evil and you're an enemy of God, and you will drift if you don't know your past state and the condition you were in. Because if you were morally fairly good, then when Jesus comes, yeah, I know I wasn't perfect, he helps me be a little bit better. No, no, here's what Paul's saying. It's not that you weren't perfect. It's that you were dead. You were dead. He puts it this way in Colossians 2.13. When you were dead in your sins... And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He says, you want to stop the drift? You have to understand the significance of what Jesus does. And if you do not see your pre-Christ life as dead, you will not see the significance of what he did, and you'll have to add more to it. Some of you who are here this morning or watching online, and you're not Christians, you haven't given your life to Christ, you're still trying to figure it out, you're dead. And I know you're looking at me going, oh, I don't know about that. I'm here. I'm listening to you. You're upsetting me. My mind and my soul seem to be working pretty well. The Bible talks about our spirit being dead. Your physical body and your soul may not be dead, so you can sit here and listen to me and get maybe a little upset with me. But they're just waiting to catch up to your spiritual body. You are dead. The good news is, I know somebody who can take you from death to life. And this is why we need to know Christ did not need to die to improve your life. He did not need to die to fix your marriage. He taught you how to do that. He did not need to die to change your values and make you a, a more moral person. He did not need to die to give you wisdom so you could walk in abundance. None of those things that are all good that he participates in, he didn't need to die for any of that. He needed to die because you were dead and he needed to make you alive. That's why he needed to die. And Paul says, you gotta start there. You have to understand you were dead. That was your condition, so that every morning you wake up and there may be hardships and there may be circumstances, but you go, I'm alive, and there is nothing I can do to add to that. He has made me alive. You go, how does that work, Joel? There's a story in the New Testament about a lady who had this issue of bleeding for 12 years straight. It made her just not only physically unclean and ill and unholy, 
It made her spiritually unclean. She wasn't allowed to go into the synagogue because she was seen as unclean by Jewish law. It made her socially unclean. She couldn't be in public. Nobody could touch her and she couldn't touch anybody because the uncleanliness and the unholiness that was on her would get on people if she touched them. So she was completely isolated. This is a woman who psychologically, emotionally, physically, and spiritually is an absolute tormented isolation. And she thinks to herself, if I could just touch the hem of Jesus, he could heal me completely. The Old Testament prophet Malachi says the Messiah would come with healing in his wings. That word wings means the tassel, the hem of their garment. And she's thinking to himself, that's what the Bible promises. If I do that, then I'll get all healing. But she's not allowed to do that. Because if she touches Jesus, her unholiness and uncleanliness goes on him Many of you know the story. Jesus is walking to do another miracle, and there's this whole crowd around him. And this lady, in a dire move, reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. And he stops, because he knows power has gone out of him. And everybody looks, and they see this woman, and they know, oh no, she has made the rabbi, the Messiah, Jesus, she has made him unclean and unholy. But that was not the case. Her unholiness did not get on him, but his holiness, his cleanness got on her. She stands up completely healed. There is this great exchange that goes on. Paul says, you were dead, absolutely dead, with no hope whatsoever. And the Son of God, because he loves you, comes and he dies for you and he puts his holiness on you. How? Because a little time later, after the miracle of the woman, Jesus would hang on the cross. And in that moment, there would be this amazing exchange. Because he would take on the uncleanliness and the unholiness of this entire identity of the world of you and I. And we would take on his holiness. That's what he does for us. Remember the story of the paralytic? Here's the paralytic. He rode, comes through the roof. He's laying. He can't walk. Jesus comes up to him. What does he say? Your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine the paralytic going, really? Can we deal with the spiritual stuff later? I need to walk. And I wonder in a conversation if Jesus looked at this paralytic and said, you know, you think your greatest problem is walking. Look at the people in this room. They walk. You think they're all happy? You think they're all fulfilled? Your greatest problem is not walking. Your sins are forgiving. I am taking you from death to life this is the starting point, Paul says. You got to get this right. You know who you were, but now you got to know who you are. Look at verse 22. But now he has reconciled you through the death of Christ in his physical body to present you holy and blameless in God's sight as you stand before him without a single fault. It's like Paul says, here's what Jesus does. He presents you to the Father, the whole new you. A few years ago, I had a friend come alongside. He said, Joel, you really should brand yourself. I, I got no idea what he's talking about, but you should brand. And he offered to help me. You got you to brand yourself. It's where you put your best foot forward. You create this kind of true, but nonetheless an image for people out there to see who you are, what you have to offer. You got to brand yourself. And I discovered everybody is branding themselves. I got to put myself out there. So when people see me, my image, how I look, put my best self, I'll try to be authentic. Some of us are not as authentic, but nonetheless, I'm going to brand myself and put it out there in some ways to, to show ourselves to others. In some ways, that's what Jesus does. He says, I'm going to show you to the Father. But Jesus doesn't just help improve our brand. He gives us his brand. We take on his identity. Too often times we just see Jesus as kind of making me look better, improving my life, shaping me. He goes, no, 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 you got to know who you are. This is who you are. You are holy. You are blameless. You are pure. Now I say that, think about yourself. You are holy. You are blameless. You are pure. Many of you are going, you have no idea how I talked to my wife this morning. 
You have no idea the thoughts I had this week. You have no idea. And we have a hard time getting a hold of the new me in an identity. The current reality doesn't seem to say that, so we think, I gotta add to the brand. I gotta add something more than what Jesus did. So either I'll show myself religiously devout, or I'll have a life of significance, or something that I will add to Jesus. And Paul said, no. You gotta know who you were, you were dead. And because of the work of Christ, you are now fully and completely alive, and your identity is in him. That's all there is to it. You are right there. And nothing can be added to that. You are holy. You are pure. You are blameless. That's you. You got to learn to live in that, to walk in that, but that's you. My wife and I have been married for 35 years. That's a long time to be married, isn't it? Yeah, you're... Honestly, you're probably clapping for her more than me, aren't you? I know that. So 35 is a big number. So people would come up to me and they say, Joel, how did you do it? I mean, really, what's the secret to 35 years together? I said, there's one thing. Do this one thing. If you do this one thing, you will have the greatest marriage ever, forever. You just gotta do this one thing. For 35 years, every week, Marie and I have done this one thing. And if you do this one thing, it will change your marriage forever. Every week for 35 years, Marie and I have gone dancing. She goes on Tuesdays, I go on Thursdays. <laughs> I shared this like three or four times with her next to me, and after like the fourth time, she looked at me and she goes, Joel, that's enough now. <laughs> and I learned the secret to a really long marriage is when your wife says, that's enough now, that's enough now. <laughs> but here's the deal. In 35 years, we haven't always looked married. We haven't always acted married. In 35 years, we haven't always even felt married. But we have this covenant before the Lord that says we are married. No matter how we look, no matter how we feel, no matter how we act, we are married. And there are times in our life we don't really feel married to Jesus. We may not even act married to Jesus. And we may not even look necessarily married to Jesus, but we have this covenant because of what he has done through the cross that says, I am married to Christ. I was dead, but now I am fully alive. And if you don't get a hold of this and you don't live in this, the drift will take place. Since I don't look it and I don't feel it and I don't act it, I gotta add to it. Paul says, no, no, know who you were, not just morally, spiritually, know who you are. But then he goes on and says, okay, now you gotta live in it. Look at verse 23. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the hope you received when you heard the gospel. We do not add to the work of Christ, but we do act in a response to it. There's nothing Marie and I can do to be more married but there is effort we can give so that our marriage can flourish and be wonderful and joyous as God designed it to. And in verse 23, Paul says you gotta do these three things. If you do these three things, knowing who you were and who you are, then you will never face the drift. You gotta believe, you gotta stand, and you have to hope. First, you gotta believe. He unpacks this a little bit more in Colossians chapter two, verse six and seven. He says, so then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith. That's the foundation of all this. As you were taught and overflowing with thanksgiving, I want you to see faith in a different light. Faith is this incredible gift from God. Because when Paul says, listen, you want to walk in the fullness of the new you? Here's the foundation. Just believe. Do you know what he's also saying? You do not have to achieve it. You do not have to fully understand it. There may be elements of it that are a mystery to you. You may have a little bit of a rough week. You don't have to fully figure it out. You do not have to be perfect. The gift of faith means we have to trust Jesus, his words and his actions, but I don't need to figure it all out. I don't need to be perfect. I do not need to achieve it. And it's as if, here's what Paul is saying, some of you, stop trying so hard. 
Jesus has won it for you. Stop trying so hard. This is the good news where there is this freedom. Because right now you're walking around with a weight on your shoulders. What can I do? No, it's done. And you got to believe, and that's the foundation. And you act on that foundation of faith. That's when the action is easy. Reading your Bible and praying, coming to church, worshiping, those are at ease because they're a response to, I'm trusting Jesus with this. But if those are, this is how I add to Jesus, they come with a weight to make sure you do it and you do it right. I told you this passage really jammed me up because I wanted this year, 2023, for me to get closer to the Lord. Closer was kind of my theme. So I took 12 different disciplines, one for every month, that I'm just going to really study and practice throughout 2023. So the first one is the Sabbath. So I thought, I'm going to do the Sabbath. But I got to be honest with you. At the beginning of kind of planning this out and figuring out, and at the end of December, I'm getting ready for it, I find myself in the drift. Because my mindset is, okay, I'm going to do the Sabbath. I'm going to take a Sabbath every week. I'm going to go into a cave with my big King James Version Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to just sweat drops of blood. I'm going to do the things good religious Christians do because I'm a minister of the gospel. And when I do that, I can come out of the cave going, see God? <laughs> Truth. Then I start studying this passage to teach you all, and all of a sudden I went, oh, I began to study the Sabbath, and I discovered in the Sabbath one of the primary reasons God created the Sabbath was he wanted to give us a day when we could look to the future full Sabbath. So he says, stop all the other work you do the other six days. Make this one holy. It's like the Holy Spirit said, Joel, what do you want that day to look like if it was heaven? How would you live this day if it was a day in heaven? And I knew for sure, me, my two grandsons, and Jesus just together. Sorry, honey. Just me, my two grandsons, and Jesus just together. That would be a day in heaven. And instead of in my cave doing my religious rituals, adding to Jesus, all of a sudden, I took my two grandsons to the beach. We played together. We prayed together. We talked about Jesus together. We looked at his creation together. We wrestled in the sand together. And it was a glorious day of drawing to Christ. There is an ease to really good practices when it's built on this foundation of faith. I'm trusting him. Whether I read the Bible this morning or not, I'm trusting him. Now, maybe for you, you know, 12 disciplines, 12 months is a little too heavy. Maybe it's just First Wednesdays. They start in a few weeks. First Wednesdays, for those of you who don't know, is when we come together as a church on Wednesday night, the first Wednesday of every month. February 1st will be the first one. March 1st will be the second one. And we spend about an hour, and we just, we worship, we pray, we get exhorted by the word, it kind of all melts together. We have an encounter with God. And maybe for you going, if I just do First Wednesdays, that's going to help me through the month, not drift. But that is based upon trust. And there is an ease. And there is this freedom. Because I'm trusting him. He's the one who did the work. Then Paul says, you got to stand. He unpacks this in Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the word that really pops out of me on this verse is the word you. Never in the entire letter of Colossians does Paul say you in the singular. It's always you in the plural. It's like he's saying, you gotta stand. You have to know that part of the Christian walk on this planet is that there is a temptation and a force that will cause you to drift. It will not cause you necessarily to reject or rebel against Jesus. It will cause you to try to add to Jesus. And that force will be there. So you've got to have this foundation of faith, and then you've got to know we got to stand firm. But you do that together. You cannot stand firm alone. The drift is too strong and too subtle. Can you imagine me in Huntington Beach on the beach? I was alone. I don't know much about that. If Pastor Sam, our young adult pastor, who's a great surfer, I'm the faller, he's the surfer, if he was there and he understands the water, he'd say, Joel, watch out for the drift over here. Maybe you should be over here. He would have warned me. He would have helped me in such a great way, but I was all alone, and so the drift took place. And some of you here understand what I'm talking about, but you're trying to fight the drift alone, and Paul says, no, you got to stand together. This last week, you got an email from the church about these classes that we offer. 
Our Cottonwood members get together around round tables and our pastors teach these amazing classes. That's how you stand together. I'm not gonna let the drift take place. I'm gonna walk in that freedom. If you didn't get that email, just a side note, we're trying not to clutter up Sundays with announcements. So about twice a month, we send out an all-church email. It's a really important email because it tells you of really cool programs and events we have going on all throughout the month so we don't clutter up Sunday. So if you didn't get that email, get on that email list so you can just keep track with what's going on. You can do that today by just simply texting the word CONNECT to 605-405. It'll put you on that list. If you didn't get an email this last week that told you about the cool classes our pastors are teaching, get, get on that list and it'll really help you keep up to date. But the point is, is that you gotta do something, Paul says. Stand is a verb. In 2023, remember John talked to us at the end of worship, what will you do together with spiritual friends that will lock you in when the temptation comes during hard times or confusing times or difficult times, you are locked in and you will not drift to wanting to add anything to Jesus. You gotta believe, you gotta stand. And then lastly, he says, you have to hope. Look at Colossians chapter three, verses one through four. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. You gotta trust. You don't have to achieve, you don't have to figure it all out, you don't have to fully understand, you don't have to perform. You trust Jesus. You gotta stand together. You gotta do something so you're solid. But then he says, you gotta hope in the future. You can't define your faith just by these 80 years. You gotta understand that what Jesus did for you is for an eternity. And if we're honest, sometimes we get too caught up so much with the day that we're in that our hearts and our minds are not on things above. We're not thinking about that appearing in glory moment. Imagine a sand glass, an hourglass. We look at this hourglass and it's got a top half and it's got a bottom half. And we all look at the same way. We're all looking at the top half and we see sand coming out of that top half. And the more the sand comes out, the more nervous we get because life is coming to an end. But the Bible teaches that as Christians, we do not look at the top half of the sand glass. We look at the bottom half. We look at that bottom half going, you know what? Every day I am becoming more alive. Every day I'm getting more faith. Every day I'm becoming more full of joy. Like money putting in the bank account, every day I am gaining more. Yes, my physical body may be decaying, but make no mistake about it. The true me is truly coming alive with faith and victory and joy and peace because I am living for eternity. I look at that bottom half. Now I understand there are some of you here this morning and you are going through a really hard time now. And I am so sorry for that. Paul and I would want you to know two things. One, God knows what you are going through. And he is active and you may not see it right now but you have to have a trust in his promises and his word and you gotta stand on that, that he is working. But the second thing Paul says is, listen, as hard as that is, as all-consuming as that can be, do not let your current hardship steal your joy of a future eternity with Jesus. Do not let that current hardship steal your excitement about as hard as this is, there is a day coming. There is a day coming. I was dead I am now alive. There is a new me who is holy and blameless and pure. And there is a day coming when I will live in eternity with him where there will be no sickness and no sadness and no hardship. And there is nothing I need to do today to add to Jesus. He is everything. How do you think they responded when they read Paul's letter? They're probably huddled in a house. I think they probably had the same jarring moment I had a few weeks ago. <gasps> wow. 
I've drifted. I'm seeing the Sabbath as something I can add to Jesus to prove myself. I had that same kind of, whoa, we have to respond to this. So we're going to close this service with a response, just you and the Lord. Because my guess is there are some of you in here who would say, wow, Joel, you described me. I wasn't even aware of it. I'm not rejecting Jesus. I'm not rebelling or denying. But I am adding to him to try to find all meaning and purpose in life. And I need to go back to know who I was dead, who I am alive, holy, pure, blameless, and how I live in that. And as we respond, there's another group that's here. And there are some of you who you're not even quite sure why you're here. You're not a Christian. You're not a Christ follower. You're still kind of searching, to, figuring it out, trying to decide what's right, what's wrong for you. And maybe when I talked about the fact that you were dead, it was a little upsetting to you. I get that. But you also know that beyond my words, the Holy Spirit has been tugging on your heart. And I mean it with all sincerity when I say, I know someone right now in this moment who can take you from death to life. The Bible talks about being born again. To do that, you gotta be able to say three things to him. You literally have to be able to say three things to the Lord. You gotta first be able to say, I believe. I may not fully understand it, but I believe somewhere in a corner of my heart, I know you are the Son of God and that you love me and you died and resurrected for me. I believe you are God and you love me. If you can say, I believe, without fully understanding everything. Second thing is you say, I'm sorry. You recognize that you have tried to be the orchestrator of all of your life. You have put yourself in control, not your creator, and you just go, I'm sorry. The Bible calls it confessing your sin. And the third thing you do is you say, I'm ready. Lord, I am ready for a life of freedom and victory and purpose and joy in you and all that you have done. Fill me with your spirit, I'm ready. And if you can say those three things, you can go in this moment from death to life. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask everybody to bow their heads, close your eyes. I'm actually not gonna lead you in a prayer because you're gonna spend the rest of your life talking to the Lord, you might as well start now. So I'm just gonna tell you these three areas and give you just a moment to tell Jesus. And you gotta know, as funky as this may feel, he is right here and he is at work and you will go from death to life. First, take a moment and just tell him, I believe. I believe you are the son of God. I don't fully understand why you would love me, but I do believe it. God has given you that gift of faith. Tell him you believe, wrap it in gratitude. Next, tell him you're sorry. Just in a sentence, acknowledge that you have been the boss over your life. And it hasn't always worked out that well. Tell him you're sorry. That you want to give your life and lordship of your life to him. And then lastly, say, I'm ready, Lord. I'm ready for life. I'm ready for all that comes in the kingdom of God. I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready for peace in my heart that passes all understanding. I'm ready for joy and victory. I'm ready for an eternity. Tell him you are ready to be holy, blameless, pure. Lord, you hear these prayers. So many of us join with them. We believe. We believe that we were dead and you made us alive. Jesus, only you. We're sorry. Thank you for grace and forgiveness that there is nothing you ask of us, that you paid the penalty for our sins, that we could have eternal life with you, and we are ready. We are ready for a life of faith. We're ready to stand firm 
We are ready to walk in a hope and a freedom for eternity. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'm gonna ask everybody to stand to your feet. We're gonna do one more thing because there are many of you in here who you walked in this morning and you were a Christian. You love God. You're like the church in Colossae, but you also acknowledge, wow, I was drifting. I want you to lift your hands just to heaven. Just hold them up. You know what you're doing? You are asking God for the gift of freedom because you came in not even knowing that there was a weight on your shoulder. There was a weight of performance. There was a weight of achievement. There was a weight of despair. And you are lifting your hands going, God, would you give me a freedom, a freedom that only comes from Jesus, a freedom in Christ to walk in victory and joy, not because I read my Bible this morning, not because I have separated myself from others and worked on my brand, but because of what you have done, your life, your death, your resurrection, you have made me new. You're saying, give me a freedom to believe and to walk in the reality that I am holy and blameless and pure. And the Father looks on me and says, I love you. You are my beloved child. That's what you're doing with your hands lifted up. Jan and the team are gonna lead us in a worship course and we're going to sing this prayer a prayer of faith, and that weight you had, it's gonna go away. It's just gonna go away. That drift, you are no longer gonna be in the ocean. You are gonna be right here at the footstool of Christ worshiping him. Let's worship the Lord.